привет. Привет. И הפרויקט הזה נולד לי ככה בשנייה, ואני בטוח שירושלים זה מקום שמעניין את כל העולם. וחשבתי שלהכיר את ירושלים דרך אבנים או דרך בניינים זה טוב, אבל לא מספיק טוב. ואני בטוח שלהכיר את המקום צריך דרך האנשים שלו. אז עשיתי לעצמי רשימה קטנה של אנשים שבשבילי הם אנשים מעניינים. Okay. אני אזכיר לך, אני לא יודע אם אתה זוכר, הכרתי אותך בהשתלמות מורי דרך, הייתי עם מורי דרך ברובע הארמני, היית mm. עם חבר, פגשתם אותנו. אה, כן, 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 כן. אז הייתי בקבוצה הזו, זו הייתה פעם ראשונה שהייתי במנזר. זה הארמני. וזה היה לפני שנתיים, כן, בערך, שנתיים לפני וחצי. לפני הקורונה. וכבר אז, בשיחות קצרות, הבנתי שאתה בן אדם מאוד מעניין, ובן אדם שחושב out of the box. זאת הדעה שלי. מלדץ. והבנתי שאתה ממש בפנים בתוך העולם הארמני, אתה שייך לעולם הארמני. הייתי It doesn't happen all at the same time. One of the first memories that I have is that me and my Armenian friends, we went to the Christian quarter, uh, which was very close to us, but it was worlds away. It was close, but it was worlds away. We went there and we wanted to buy uh, fireworks. And in Arabic, they say fatish. So we wanted to buy fireworks because it was Christmas or New, or New Year's. And uh, I remember when we went there, we were, it was as if we were going to a different world. We were nervous. We were looking around. Where are we going? You know, who are these people? And I even remember like at one point, a Palestinian kid, you know, in the Christian quarter was like, you know, he yelled at us because I don't know, he had some, he had some very different understanding of what an Armenian is. That was, like, you know, the, one of the first interactions that I had with the non-Armenian world of Jerusalem. But you know, as, as we got older, I went to Bejala, uh, you go to West Jerusalem more, and you understand that, uh, okay, the Armenian quarter is, is not all of Jerusalem, not everybody in Jerusalem is Armenian. You come out of your shtetl, <laughs> would be the word. And uh, that's how we sort of explored, and how we explored, and we understood that we were not the only ones here, and also that we were living in a city that had many other problems. And uh, we were not in the spotlight of those problems. You know, we were on the side. We were not sitting on the bench. We were sitting on the bench, but we were not even important enough because in the Armenian bubble, the Armenians are the most important people and Armenia is the most important thing. But once you come out of that bubble, you realize the world does not give a damn about you. You're, you're on the side, you know, you're, uh, you're a decoration, maybe, maybe in Jerusalem, you know, maximum, you're a decoration. But, you know, that was life. I want to ask you about the people around you. Who are these people, your friends, your people you know? It means to understand uh, is Jerusalem. your friend. It means to understand Jerusalem, my friends around me. It depends on the day, it depends on the hour. I have, uh, an Ar- I have a circle of Armenian friends, I have a circle, which is the smallest circle because there aren't a lot of Armenians. I have a circle of Palestinian friends, I have a circle of Israeli friends, I have a circle of foreigner friends. Sometimes, uh, some nights, in some events, all of these circles meet each other, you know? They all come at the same time. Sometimes it's uh, different eggs in different baskets, you know, where, you know, this doesn't come to this, this doesn't come to this. But it's, uh, look, this is Jerusalem. I, I, I don't believe, some people will tell you Jerusalem is a, United city it all works. I, I don't think so. I think Jerusalem is a divided city, but I work with the division You know if I have some friends here some friends there. I'll go to this. I'll go to that There are some good things here some good things there. I'll take a bit of this. I'll take a bit of that I don't overthink it. You it don't is try to put it in one uh, basket. And no, I, I My life in general. I don't try to put every egg in one basket. I'm very in English the word is co- compartmentalization where you put it in compartments so I'm very into compartmentalization and uh, yeah that's how I do it. Jerusalem is a lot of Armenian. Yes, less than 700. Less than 700. And they are also a mute. 
ואנשים בארץ לא מכירים באמת מי אלה הארמנים. אבל אני ואתה יודעים שכמה מאות הארמנים האלה הם לא אותם ארמנים, הם שונים. כן. גם מבחינת גלי ההגעה לפה, גם מבחינת התפיסה, אז אם אתה יכול לספר קצת על השוני בין הארמנים. טוב. אז יש הגל, let's do it in English, there's the first wave, which to make it simple, let's just call it the crusader wave, okay? They came here during the crusader times. Because the first, okay, these words, you need to be very careful. The first three Jerusalem crusader queens, the first three crusader queens of Jerusalem were Armenian. And they brought a lot of our, our Armenians with them. Although the Armenian church was here more or less, but they brought a lot more Armenians with them. And we call them uh, Kakatsis. Kakatsi in Armenian means a citizen, but in this context, it means a local. Who is we? We are the second wave. I come from the second wave. The second wave are the survivors from the genocide. Okay, we came 1915 onwards. From 1915, like my family, 1921. So where are the second wave? We are called Kachtagan. Kachtagan is refugee. So where are the Kachtagans? Uh, There was, a, there was a difference between, you know, the crusader community and the refugee com community. The crusader community, after so many years here, had forgotten how to speak in Armenian. Like, they didn't speak Armenian as much. While we do. Like, when the refugees came, Armenian got a, a new life in the community. So now everybody was speaking in Armenian. Uh, and we also, the refugees, we also came with a more of a trauma. So we came... with this idea of building the bubble, the Armenian bubble, because the refugees that came, they came with an idea to preserve the Armenian identity. They needed to take care of the Armenian identity, not to, not to integrate, not to assimilate, take care of what, what we have. So I believe the Armenian bubble is more for a result of the, Arme of the refugee wave rather than the other wave. And then in 1990 and 1991, you had the Soviet with uh, in israel they say gal harusim right but people don't know that no not everyone was a russian in gal harusim you had belarusians you had georgians you had ukrainians and, you, yeah. and you had armenians uh they mostly live in petah tikva or baha merkaz you know uh one big difference between them and our two waves is that they are officially jewish okay so you couldn't come here if you were not jewish right because they came after Israel. We are before Israel. So on our papers, we are Christian. You know, on their papers, I'm sure they're Jewish. But... At least one of them. Uh, yeah, at least one of them. But they're Armenian. Like, to me, I talk with them in Armenian. We sing the same songs. We dance the same way. And they do come to church. I'm not sure they <laughs> should supposed to, but you know but as good as me, that uh, many people in this Gal HaRusim Go to, they go to church, you know, they have kept the traditions from the old country. And uh, so these are the three dif dif different waves, more, more or less, you know. Yeah. And I believe our wave, the refugee wave, which is, uh, which is the wave of the diaspora, more or less. We, we say the traditional diaspora. Traditional diaspora is the wave of the genocide, or the refugees. I think we're... our time in the diaspora is coming to an end. Like, because uh, the Soviet wave, that is not only here, it's around the world, I think they are now replacing the traditional diaspora. I think every hundred years, there is a replacement. One diaspora takes over the, the other diaspora. And I think that is what is going to happen here, sooner or later, which is okay. I mean, it's na na nature. This is how evolution works, so. <laughs> Let's talk about uh, Jerusalem a little bit. All right. We are sitting in Jerusalem. We see beautiful views of Jerusalem. And Jordan. <laughs> and Jordan and Palestinian Authority. <laughs> when, I think, when I think with myself, I speak with myself sometimes. All right. And I think why a lot of my friends left Jerusalem to Tel Aviv, to center. And I'm here. And I can explain to myself why I am here. Why is Jerusalem is special, different uh, city? 
Okay. But I'm sure that maybe you have another reason. So do you like Jerusalem? And, and if you really like, so why? Or not? Look, if you find me drunk at night, I'm loving Jerusalem. <laughs> <laughs> when I wake up in the next morning, maybe it's a bit different. But I don't... I wouldn't say that I do not like Jerusalem. I don't hate Jerusalem. I do not not like Jerusalem. It's my home city. It's it's uh, it ha it's connected to me being an Armenian. We Armenians in Jerusalem, we call ourselves Sarima Hai. Hai is Armenian and Armenian. Hai. Sarima is Jerusalemite. So we say we are Jerusalemite Armenian because it's a way to take our local identity. Because my local identity is not Yerevan. You know, it's it's not uh, the cities in Armenia. I'm, my home city is Jerusalem. My homeland is Armenia. So when we say we are Sari Mahai, we're Jerusalemite Ar Armenian, we are combining our local identity, which is Jerusalem, with our national identity, which is Armenian, right? They're two different identities. And uh, so I've never, so even when we're born in our childhood, we've always had this, our parents and our community always, uh, wanted to remind us over and over again that don't forget you're Jews, my Armenian. And being an Armenian from Jerusalem comes with a bit of a, a legacy or a responsibility because we have churches here that are very important. Look, we have uh, the Holy Sepulchre, right? We have a part of it. Now, I know there are millions, you know, there are Christian countries all over the world that have more people than Armenians, right? They don't have anything in the Holy Sepulchre. We, the small nation of Armenians, we have the Holy Sepulchre, the nativity, all this. And that comes a responsibility that Armenians in Jerusalem should take care of or, you know, should stand their ground and try to preserve it. And that does not happen by hating Jerusalem. That only happens by appreciating Jerusalem for its good and for its bad. Uh, so I have never... I do not understand people that say they hate Jerusalem because I feel like they don't know Jerusalem. Jerusalem is not an easy, uh, an easy city to live in. Nobody said it is. But look, if I take you to Berlin, I'm pretty sure in five years you'll tell me it's not an easy city to live in. I mean, I don't know. Like not every city is supposed to be easy to live in. And somebody told me yesterday that being a Jerusalemite is a mission. Now, I don't know whether being Religious Jerusalemite person? is a mission. Uh, not really, but somebody that comes from the Christian community. But being an Armenian Jerusalemite is definitely is a mission because you're not only there for Jerusalem, you're also there to preserve this small part of Armenia that's here. Because the Armenian Quarter is a part of Armenia, you know? Important part. A very important part. Whenever an Armenian comes from Armenia or from other parts of the diaspora, the moment they walk into the Armenian quarter, they see Armenian flags, they see Armenian churches, they see Armenian crosses, they see Armenians speaking in Armenian. And I can assure you, even the most non-nationalistic Ar Ar Armenian becomes nationalistic in that moment. And they say, no, we have to take care of this. We have I to belong take care of this. here from my heart. This is, you know, this is ours. We have to take care of it. It comes with, uh, it comes with a responsibility. I don't know if we will succeed. Let me be honest. I don't think Armenian community will be around in a hundred years. The church will be. The community, civilians like me, we will not be around. I, you, need, you need to convince me that I'm, th that I'm wrong. Right now, I think that I'm not wrong, that it's more or less over. Uh, but that is, that is life. Like, I'm not here to change that, you know. I, my thoughts are on Armenia itself at the moment. Somebody will take care of I don't know, I, like it's sad, the situation, but as you said, pachot mi shvameot. You want 700 people to go up against millions and billions of people that want Jerusalem. I don't know how they'll do it. I feel that uh, your Armenia, different from a priest in the old city Armenia, like his Armenia, yeah. and maybe few Armenians in the same place. That's what I feel from your explanation. Look, everybody has a different experience. Everybody has a different story. 
And everybody lives a different life in, in Jerusalem, right? Even within the Armenian quarter, you have different lives. Not everybody lives the same Armenian life. Uh, but I, I come from this opinion that our, that our Armenia in Jerusalem is changing. It is changing. Our Armenia in Jerusalem is changing. In 1948, before the wars, we had 10,000 Armenians. Okay? And now we have 700. But the other thing is, the, the Mizar Armeni was never built, or the Rova Armeni, Vegama Mizar Armeni, were never built for a community. They were built for pil pilgrims, you know, for pilgrims to come and leave. So having a community of civilians here permanently staying in, in the eyes of evolution or in the eyes of history is an abnormality, you know, because you're only talking about a hundred years of us being here as a community civilians or less than that, actually. No, a bit more than that, but it, it was never supposed to happen, you know, and then it did. But I think history is a very strong force that you cannot stop. And if the history has decided that no, Armenians in Jerusalem are not supposed to exist, or they're, you know, as civilians, then they'll do. Because before the genocide, before our wave, the Crusader wave, they were almost over. Their, their luck came when the genocide uh, wave came here, when you the survivors saved came. the Armenian Jerusalem. The, yeah. We say the, the civilian com community. We gave it a new chance. New blood. Yeah. But after a hundred years, it, this chance that was given is about to, the light is about to go, you know, it's about to fade away. It's about to go off, switch off. But that's history. You cannot change that. What you can do is decide how you're going to Influence. How you're going to influence. But in English, I would say to end it on your own terms. I'm going to decide how to end it. This is what I've been telling Armenians, my friends. We have, we have to decide how we end this. Some people believe it's going to go on. Well, bravo if you believe it's going to go on. I'm supporting you. Why, why not? Prove me wrong. Prove me wrong. But they maybe don't know how to go on with this problem. No, but they believe that some, you know, most people always have this, uh, this uh, thought that somebody somewhere sometime will take care of their problems. You don't have to deal with it. Somebody somewhere sometime will take care of it. I think it's a, not only Armenians, I think many nations, many people around All the world them. have that. And if you believe that somebody someplace sometime will take care of it, then uh, it's a, it's a, in, in, inshallah, Bezrat Hashem moment. Allah okay. Akbar. You want to go with that? Go with that. <laughs> what am I going to do to you? <laughs> I really don't know anything about your family. <laughs> Maybe a few words about what they came here 100 years ago. Not what? 100. Oh, it's going to be 100. You're yeah, right. Yeah. Shit, we, we have to leave. <laughs> we have this to year, leave. yeah. So what... B'mayim avdu, ma'im asu, echem istadu. Okay, Yes, my family came here in 1921 and we're 2021. Which is, you just remind me, I do have to move to Armenia because there is a saying that if you live someplace for 100 years, that's it, you already have roots. And I grew up in a family that was always about, you, we need to return to, to Armenia. We have to stop diaspora, being a diaspora, whatever. My family, my great-grandfather, great-grandfather, uh, was a kid, was a boy during the genocide. And uh, his father put him in the care of a Turkish uh, butcher, you know, for meat, meat butcher. And his family died. We believe that we come from uh, a family of teachers, because Sahagyan means the son of the wise. And there was a Sahagyan school back in the city where we came from. And uh, so my great-grandfather stayed with this Turkish meat butcher for a few years, from 1915. For a few years and then the turkish butcher wanted to convert him to islam and marry his daughter so my great grandfather his name was hagop he ran away to constantinople in constantinople which was under the british 
and the uh, and the allied powers not like istanbul. istanbul constantinople th when he went was under the brits it was still not istanbul yet uh it is before ataturk came it's a period in between and there he met my great grandmother who was from the same city as he came from and before ataturk came before ataturk rose the Allied powers, like the British, the Americans, whatever, they told the Armenians, go back to your homes. It's all good. Go back. So they went back. He was supposed to go to France, but he said, okay, we'll go back. They went back. And that's when Ataturk rose again. So they ran away again. This time they got on a ship. They were supposed to go to France. But my great grandfather heard that his brother Oskan, who went to fight in Baku with the Armenians uh, during the there were some uh, di during the Armenian Tatar Wars and during the British campaigns of the Caucasus, they were in Baku. He found out that he was alive in Jerusalem. I assume because the Brits had Baku during that time when the Brits were here, he had found a corridor to come from there to 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 Jerusalem. So my great grandfather said, okay, we're not going to go to France, we're going to go to Jerusalem, 1921. He came here, 1921, to Jerusalem. He met his brother in the Armenian quarter, who was still alive. And in 1948, after the war, his brother left to, Ar left to Argentina, but my great-grandfather stayed. And they, and they worked in tailor, tailor is like for closing, you know, they worked in tailor shops. Uh, my great-grandfather, my grandfather also. My father, at the age of 13, got in trouble at school, at the Armenian school, where you and I met. He got in trouble there, and he decided he was not going to go back to school, which is a shame because he, he, he was, like, he's a smart guy. He reads a lot of books. He speaks one, his, his Armenian is one of the best in the community. But at age of 13, he got in trouble at school, said he's not going to go back. So he went to Talpiot and started to work in Musakh, like in garages. So my dad is a Musakhnik since the age of 13, until now actually. And uh, that's what my family, that's my family story. But uh, we were raised, at least for, because my father is very politically active in the Armenian community, in Armenia and all that. We were raised with the message that we need to move to Armenia. Now that Armenia is independent, that the Soviet Union has fallen, it's our responsibility to go back to Armenia to make sure that Armenia has a good future and that we need to be there, you know. So that's my family. I want to touch... By the way, there might be an interesting factor. I said there was a Sahagyan school back in the city that we came from. One day, I read somewhere in an academic paper, I might be wrong, but I read it somewhere in an academic paper that I forgot, that Ataturk uh, be began his movement for Turkish independence and the Turkish war of independence. He began it at the Sahagyan school of that city. So like the, the rise of Ataturk was, was carried out, was fulfilled, re realized in the emptiness, in the empty space of, of, of my family. You know, that's where it started out. I don't know, it was an interesting thing that I once read. Me and Ataturk are, con are connected in some way. Uh, by the way, I want to touch uh, the topic of uh, music, how music came uh -huh. to your life. And uh, I've heard that you very famous in some places around here. So some. Uh, music, I, I always grew up with music around me because uh, in most Armenian families, there is always a piano. Even if you don't play the piano, there is a piano. Also, my father came from an Armenian, was involved in an Armenian political party, still is, uh, the Armenian Revolutionary Fe Federation, the Dashnak Tsutsun. If somebody wants Armenian. Say it again. Dashnak Tsutsun, Armenian Revolutionary Fe Federation. Uh, and the Dashnak Tsutsun was created in 1890, 1890 in Tiflisi, okay? Or in Tiflis, as, as it used to be called. During the Soviet times, they were exiled because they were a nationalistic uh, group. Uh, but they 
kept the stories of, of Armenia and they also kept the stories of the Armenian fighters that fought Turkey, like they fought the Ottomans. They put it all into songs and music. So for 70 years across the diaspora, these revolutionary songs, as we call them, were being sung in, in the diaspora. And they were being sung in my family, in my family household. They were the Armenian folk songs, and then there were the Armenian revolutionary songs. And they were always being sung in my home. And so music was always around me. To know Armenian history was to learn it through music. And one day I picked up a, gu a guitar. I knew piano a bit. My parents taught me, brought the teacher to learn piano. I picked up the guitar. I got into Armenian folk music because I always, because I also knew my father wanted, my father has four sons. And he wanted one son to be able to carry a party, a gathering, you know? So I became that son, you know, I can, I can sit in any Armenian gathering, you give me the guitar, I'm a, I'm a jukebox. A jukebox is where you put the money and the songs are just rolling. So I'm that guy. And uh, that's how music came into my life. And afterwards I expanded, like I didn't stay only in Armenian music. I deal with a lot of Armenian folk music that I try to give another life to Armenian folk music to make sure they survive another 100 years until somebody else does it again. Also, I did the project in Arabic to practice my Arabic. I did it with some friends of mine in Bethlehem. I have a, a smaller one that I do with a friend in Hebrew. It's not as big, but the, the most, the famous one here is the Arabic one. The famous one in Armenia is the Armenian one. And there are some people that don't know about the other projects. Like, they, like if you know the Armenian one, you don't know about the Arabic one. If you know the Arabic one, you don't know about the Armenian one. You need one. to connect them. <laughs> no, but just like I said, I put my eggs in different baskets and I never bring them all together. Compartmentalization. I do it all different. I By the way, a few musicians uh, of your group in Arabic uh, lives in another part of uh, Gader, another part of the wall. The wall yeah. Uh, Ten minutes it, down the road. Yeah, I know. But is it influence uh, for, for uh, concerts, for shows, for, for your life uh, together? It influences the band, Apoin Apostles. But now we're not talking about the Armenian project. We're talking about uh, Arabic the project. Arabic yeah, yeah, project. Exactly. Uh, it does influence it because uh, they will need the Ishoim to cross the Gader or the checkpoints, as they say, right? And uh, sometimes you don't know when you... Sometimes you don't know if you do... Uh, if you say, okay, on April, on April 5th, we have a show. You don't know if they're going to come, if they're going to be allowed to pass. It's a problem sometimes, but uh, and look there, you know, you have also the political problems. But uh, we we always try to make sure that uh, we overcome these problems, uh, not not to be stopped. You know, we have we have succeeded because we are determined to succeed and to not let things stop us. Sometimes things are stronger than us and we get stopped. You play uh, in Armenian and in Arabic. It means to understand, I want... Uh, you mean the style, the genre? Style and genre, yeah. In Arabic, it would be, in English, it would be pop rock. Zekzat pop in rock. In Armenian, it's Armenian traditional folk songs. The style is folk pop, sometimes folk rock. There is a new term called ambient rock, sometimes ambient rock. Uh, they're very different. The Arabic one is very upbeat energy. It's to make you dance. The Armenian folk songs that I have till now, it's to make you think and, uh, you know, like relax and go to the mount mountains. It's, it's to take you to the to mountains. think about high material. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's to take you to another place in the mountains. The Arabic one is to get you to party, you know. In Arabic, there is a word, faya. So it's more about faya. Somebody told me, you want to do Arabic? Do faya. You want to do Armenian? Do something. Do do <laughs> do the mountains. Go chill in the mountains.
אתה נסעת לארמניה עכשיו לכמה חודשים. כן. והבנתי שהיה לך מאוד חשוב להיות שם. כן. עכשיו, ארמניה זו המולדת של העם הארמני, אבל אתה פה. השאלה שלי, למה היה לך חשוב להיות שם, ומה עשיתם שם? זו שאלה טובה. The problem is, every time a non-Armenian has asked me that, I can never give them an answer that satisfies them. I believe non-Armenians are never going to find a satisfi- satisfactory answer. Let's try. An Armenian will just answer and tell you, why not? Like, that is the first instinct that an Armenian will say. Ar- Armenia is in war. Armenia is fighting the Neo-Ottomans. It's not only Azerbaijan. It's Azerbaijan, Turkey, Hajjihadim. The Neo-Ottomans. Armenia is in war. You come and tell, tell an Armenian like me, why are you going to Armenia? I'll tell you, but why not? If not now, then when? Are you only going to go to your homeland when it's good? Maybe if not you, so who? And if not me, then who? Because it goes back to what we were saying. I, I am not one of those people that will say, somebody somewhere sometime will take care of it. I want to take care of it. Because I live now and here and now. If I don't take care of it, who? And... Because Armenia is... A, look, Armenia is not important for me just because I'm an Armenian. Uh, not, it's not important for me just because of ideology. Okay? So we, let's, uh, let's say this. I am ideologically an Armenian patriot. Sababa, I am. You know? But I believe making Armenia stronger only helps the world, not just Armenians. If Armenia is strong, then I can probably make Uh, the Caucasus, the Kafkaz, good as well, strong as well. And if the Kafkaz is strong, maybe then our Eastern Europe will be strong as well. And then, you know, there's a, in English, I say a ripple effect. It's always the effect is going to ripple and spread. And that's, I believe, if you want to take care of uh, the humanity, if you're a real humanist, then you need to take care of your own house because that will help humanity. In, like a, in a bigger way. Because one day, I don't know, maybe we'll go to Mars and we'll have to fight the Martians or I don't know which planet. We need to make sure that we have a good planet here, right? But I need to take care, I need to take care of my part of this planet, my core corner. And at the moment, I have people around me, the Neo-Ottomans, that, want to, that do not want to help this, this idea that, you know, that we have, a, we have a bigger goal here, but we need to take care of, you know, we have to find a way. They just want, they want Armenia. We want peace, they want Armenia. It doesn't work. Now that's one, okay, where it's not about patriotism. It, it's about the human, a, like a humanist ide- ideology, right? That's but one. I feel patriotism in these uh, sentences. Uh, probably, but some... You know, some people say, oh, if you're a patriot, then you're backward, you're primitive, you're only thinking, you, you are only dragging the world back. But I'm saying, no, this patriotism has a lot to do with humanism, it's to bring the world forward, not backwards. Unfortunately, I'm surrounded by, con- not by leaderships and governments that want to take the world backward. And unfortunately, because of that, I sometimes have to deal with them and also be as backward as them, or whatever. That's one. So first is patriotism, second is hum- humanism. Third, uh, maybe you're an Israeli, you'll probably understand this. Uh, Ar- Armenia is also a shelter that you need to take care of because when there was war in Iraq in 2001, the Armenians from Iraq that had to run away, there was only one country in the world that had open doors. It was Armenia. Ar- Armenia did not promise them money, economy. Armenia promised them That their doors are open if they want to find security and safety if they want to leave Iraq Armenia is welcome because they're Armenians Sababa when there was war in Syria in Halib where we had big community now we have probably like like in Jerusalem so it's already that they all ran away to Armenia Armenia opened its doors so everybody went to Armenia some states some moved on to Canada but responsibility of Armenia as a shelter is to have its doors open and So I also went there to Armenia to preserve the shelter because 
again, it's not just about ideology and patriotism here. This is our shelter. And I don't want somebody to come and take away our shelter. Why are you coming and taking away our shelter? You know, am I coming and taking away yours? No, I'm not. So why do you want to come and take, take away mine? And I believe by protecting our, our protecting our Armenia is to, is to protect the Armenian nation to say, hey, if something happens somewhere around the world, we still have this Armenia, this shelter. Okay, it's also a responsibility to make sure the shelter is stronger and not only come there when there's problems somewhere else. But even if there is problems somewhere else, I need to make sure that Armenia is still there. So that's why we go there. I mean, yeah, that's, I thought, again, these are answers that a non-Armenian will never find satisfactory. But to an Armenian, it's instinctive. You know, it's, you have to do it. Uh, there's, maybe now because we lost the war and we're in a trauma, maybe they don't think the same way anymore. Maybe Armenians right now are in a deep, dark hole where they're not thinking this way. Maybe. But it, I, like the way that I'm built, me personally, I think, no, now we have to take care of it even more. Now we, we, that impulse is still in me. If there is war right now, I'll, I'll go again, you know. I didn't go and fight. And I, we, I just helped out the refugees, you know, like kids and all that. And some of the me media, that's what I did. But if there's war again, I'll go again because it's, you have to, you know. You, you, you can't talk big words and say, and then when the time comes for it, you don't do it. I think that for the Armenian and the Jewish people, להיות מיעוט בתוך, ה... בתוך האנשים שונים, לשמור אחד על השני, והחשיבות של המולדת, מדינה שלך, ולא משנה איפה אתה גר, גם אם אתה לא בבעיות, ואתה יודע שהיא קיימת, זה עושה לך טוב. אני חושב mm-hmm. שבזה אנחנו yeah. ממש ממש דומים. ודאס על הקסואל. אסל נסואל. שעב הארמני. El Armani. El Armani, I'm a Russian. 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 I'm a في حدا بخصوص من الكونفليكت من السخسوخ فلسطيني إسرائيلي كيف العرمن تبقى للقدس شايفهم وين هم موجودين هم إخ 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 And uh, being an East Jerusalemite means you have less rights. So half of the Armenians are restricted, you know, in having less rights. So that's one, you know. Second of all, you are living in a city where, where you always have to know. Look, the Armenians, the good thing about us is that we speak Hebrew, we speak Arabic, we know Israelis, we know Palestinians, we know how, how to get, get around. But because the conflict exists, we need to know how to get around. If the conflict yeah. didn't exist, we wouldn't need to know all of these extra survival skills that, that we do know. Extra survival. Another thing, uh, because, look, right now you have extreme right-wing Jewish or organizations that believe in uh, taking properties in the old city, right? They buy properties, millions here and there. From Arabs? They usually buy it from Arabs. Uh, like if you go to a Muslim quarter, right? You know, yeah, you know yeah, the yeah. problems that they have. The organization houses. with the, a lot of people, uh, it means not... Yeah, the money goes here, then goes there, exactly. then goes to Panama, then comes back, you know, all this stuff. But somebody loses a home and somebody gets a home. Now in the Armenian community, in the Armenian quarter, we started to feel that, that uh, these organizations also have an eye on the Armenian quarter. Don't forget, the Armenian Quarter is the highest point on Mount Sinai. You talk about uh, Zion, yeah. Sinai. Mount, Mount Sion, right? So if you talk about Mount Zion, the highest point is the Armenian Quarter. We are at top of the mountain because we're mountain people. We are the Kafkaz, the Iratika, okay? And 
we they are buying up property or they're also trying to buy a property in english there is a word the judaization of the old city right now i understand why they're doing that you know they are people determined to say this is our homeland you know we're we're jewish patriots this is a jewish homeland we're here to take it but not all the people like this i'm not saying well, not all the, but i understand why they're doing it because one day if if the armenians get ararat back they'll probably act the same way i'm not saying it like like i'm not going to judge i'm not going to judge extreme patriotism because i've seen it on my side too okay but what i do judge is that the armenians have to be aware of it like we have to be careful that if our job if their job is to take our job is to make it very hard to take or not to let to take now again we can go back to my conversation that in a hundred years we will not be around here but let's make it hard to take yeah yeah you i'm know? talking about now because also the beauty of jerusalem comes from its diversity so once you take the diversity out you don't have no more jerusalem to talk about right you're going to have a one color jerusalem which is not the best in Jerusalem, if you ask me. And uh, so that's another way where the conflict is, because you are seeing, to, and now also, uh, as this is uh, rumors in Jerusalem, but the, uh, the government of Turkey is putting a lot of money through different Palestinian organizations. And to buy the To buy buildings. properties, yeah, yeah properties. to buy properties. So, you, so now you're stuck between two different uh, movements, Expansionist movements, expansions would be a good word for this. Two expansionist movements, and you have become the borderline. Because they're coming to you. They're coming, they're coming, and you are right in the middle. They're going to try to take you too, one way or the other. They're going to try to, and they have made, both of these movements have made some uh, inroads, as they say, in the Armenian quarter. They made inroads. They've, they've put their foot in. That's another way that the conflict, uh, you know, affects us. Third, third way is, I mean, look, third way is on an individual, on an individual basis. An Armenian might have a Palestinian friend or might have a Palestinian girlfriend or, or wife from Bethlehem. Okay, let's say, let's give you the most. An Armenian meets a Bethlehem girl, a Christian, Christian Palestinian, Palestinian, Christian Palestinian from Bethlehem. And let's say the Armenian is a citizen of Israel from Jerusalem. Okay, not even a Toshav, he's an Azar. To bring him, to bring her you know, all the bureaucratic problems that you're going to face right now. That also has to do with the conflict. Nobody can say that has nothing to do with the conflict. That has to do with the conflict. So, you know, you also have that problem. Yeah, there are these problems. I have a band, I have bandmates from Beit Jala, or I have friends in Beit Jala, Ru Russian friends in Beit Jala. Russian? Yeah, Russian friends in Beit Jala, where I'd like to take them one day and go to Jaffa or to Tel Aviv, sit, sit on the beach, enjoy a drink. I know I can't do that whenever I want to, you know, we, we have to wait for it and all that. So, yeah, it, it does affect sometimes, you know, because Armenians, we don't speak, Ar I mean, we're not Arabic speakers, we're not Hebrew speakers, we're Armenian speakers. So, because, so when we grew up, when we were kids, the Jews thought we were Arabs, the Arabs thought we were Jews. You know, everybody thought we were somebody else. That has to do with the conflict too, right? Because if they believe that the other one is the enemy, you all of a sudden are the total enemy because you represent both of their fears, you know, in some way or the other. You know, it happens. I don't know. I mean, this conflict, it, it, it affects ev every home, whether they're aware of it or not. It has nothing to do with me being an Armenian. I experience it in a different way, but I do not believe you have a group of people here between the river and the sea that are not affected by the conflict in, in, in some sort of way. You are. There's no way around it. Even the Russians that live in Ashkelon oh, really? are affected. <laughs> 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 the last question uh, that I want to ask, where do you see yourself in five years? Professionally, Professionally. in your life, I don't know. Try, I am. Choose. I am right now try, uh, starting to move my base of operations to Armenia. For how long? You know, it's 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 not about time. It's partly about, there, partly here. It's partly there, partly here, partly. But, but to move the base there, you know, because uh, there are a lot of things that I want to do there now. When I was there in Armenia, I met a lot of people, a lot of organizations. You know, we want to do things. We want to help out the country, the shelter. We want to help out the shelter. That's one. Professionally speaking. There are things that I've started professionally 
that have to do with culture that I do not want to talk about yet because they're nahs if I talk about them yet. I, but if they've started out well and inshallah they'll keep on going and if it does it will settle me for another 5-10 years or what, what I want to do. Can we sit here in five years and you will tell me about it? We can sit here in five years and I'll tell you about it, hopefully. And I would be more than happy to tell you about it, you know? Yeah, definitely. And I want to tell you about the time that... Thank you, Narotsky. And it was really nice. Russia and Armenia, remember, together, okay? Together, I will see you in Armenia.